Okay, this is the video lecture for uh, Ancient and Medieval History for Thursday, the uh, 12th of November, 2020. Okay, uh, what we have talked about so far is the beginning of Unit 2 in Greece. And the beginning of Unit 2, uh, which is a pretty tight narrative story, it deals with um, the rise apogee, and then decline and conquest of ancient Greece. So that is what we are focused on. And where we're going to take things is the geography. We had talked about when God is finished creating the world, he takes all the leftover bits, sweeps them up like a broom and dustpan, and that pile of debris is Greece. And if you've ever seen pictures of Greece, which I have, or been to Greece, which I have not, you will note that Greece is a rocky and mountainous country. And what that tends to do is prevent political unification. In the great river valley civilizations, from China all the way to Egypt, you have again and again the geography of those regions lending themselves to the conquest of the entire area by whoever has the most powerful army. Because there's no geographical barrier, it's just a question of whose army is supreme and whoever is, is supreme becomes overlord and everyone else becomes a slave or a subject. So, why doesn't this happen in Greece? Because of choke points created by the mountainous terrain. It is much easier in Greece for a small or weaker military to hold a position in the mountains and block the progress of an attacking army. The defensive terrain multiplies the power of troops defending themselves. And what this means is that instead of having one kingdom rule them all, one kingdom to conquer them, you have dozens, literally, of poli of city-states. A polis is a Greek city-state. So dozens of independent poli who each have their own rulers, their own system of government, their own laws, their own customs. Now they share in common being a part of the Greek culture. They are part of the Greek linguistic, cultural, and religious region. They speak variants of the Greek language. They write variants with uh, variants of the Greek alphabet, the Kyrillic alphabet. They uh, worship the Olympian gods. It is these Greeks' territories that come together at the Olympic Games. So culturally, Greece is a region. But throughout most of its uh, high point history, until the time of Alexander the Great uh, and his father, Philip of Macedon, Greece is not one single empire or one single country. And this is beneficial to a lot of the things that we, as a culture, care about. In Egypt, one man in four million people has power to make important choices, and that is the pharaoh. There, there were a few women in 3,000 years, but in general, it's a man's job. The um, likelihood of being a ruler in a Greek kingdom is probably one in 50,000. If you know anything about math or averages, you know that one in four million is a much less likely proposition than one in 50,000. But most Greek city-states experimented with government types and went well beyond kingship. Most of them end up in some form of oligarchy. An oligarchy is the rule by a committee. And that committee is the various leaders of the various factions within the kingdom. They may be the leaders of different economic groups. They may be the heads of the five families, the most important aristocratic family. We don't know. Depends on the town. Depends on the place and time. Communist societies usually end up being oligarchies unless you have some Joe Stalin or Mao Zedong dictator to take things and run them like a true tyranny. Uh, the People's Republic of China since the 70s has been an oligarchy. That is changing. Chairman Xi Jinping is trying to become the next Mao, the next dictator. The jury is still out on whether or not that will happen. But for the last 30 years or 40 years, 
China's been ruled by a committee of leading communists. That's an oligarchy. So if the Greek city-state is an oligarchy, it um, has the capacity to, uh, you have the capacity of, of having a 1 in 10,000 chance of being a ruler. And then we come to uh, Athens, the democracy. And again, while modern people win, it's not a real democracy because women and slaves and foreigners can't vote. Understand, no one in the ancient world outside of the Amazon myth gave women the right to vote in a major civilization. The, um, the idea that foreigners should be allowed to vote in your country's government is insane. That's suicide. Uh, why would you let people who have allegiance to a foreign power have control, as much control as a citizen, over your own political system? It makes no sense. And uh, slaves are tools. Uh, according to ancient law, slaves are property. They are not people. They are stripped of their humanity uh, in terms of the law and in terms of most religions. Christianity was one of the few religions that eventually came along and restored human dignity to slaves. But even with these restrictive standards, it's restrictive by our 20th, 5th, 20th and 21st century standards, because we didn't give women the right to vote until 101 years ago, um, the truth is you have a one in 20 chance or better of being born in Athens as a decision maker, as a person who can make important choices about their life and maybe even about the wider world. Greece allows for this diversity of ideas, diversity of beliefs, diversity and experiments of ideas because the geographical difficulty of conquering the whole place lets every valley, every police, every city-state be on its own. They can make voluntary associations with others, but they are voluntary because they have the capacity to protect themselves. That ability to defend their own way of life makes them independent and makes each of them an experiment in creativity and doing things differently. That's, by the way, the way the United States is supposed to function federally. We are not supposed to have one overweening central government in Washington making all the decisions. We are supposed to have 50 different states, each with their own laws, each with their own rules, within a broad agreement with one another and with the federal government in Washington. But we are not supposed to have congruency between states as diverse as Washington, Idaho, Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and so forth. They're supposed to be different. In Greece, they were. Now, <clears throat> Greece is oriented to the sea because of its incredibly long coastline. This <clears throat> coastline is simplified here. But if you stretched it out, it would extend from where Greece is out into the Atlantic Ocean. That's how long, if you take the coastline of all the islands and all the inlets of Greece and stretch them out, it would stretch across the Mediterranean out into the Atlantic Ocean. Very long coastline. Most Greeks <clears throat> live within 20 miles of the sea. And this means they have a maritime orientation, but there's something else. What makes them independent also leads them to go by sea. Here's why. Let's say I've got a dozen amphorae. An amphorae is a clay jar, a big, tall clay jar. Sometimes they're beautifully painted. And they're filled with olive oil, which is like the super product of the ancient Mediterranean world. Olive oil is used for everything from lamp oil to medicine to food uh, supplement uh, to machine oil. Olive oil is used as soap. Olive oil uh, can, is used for almost everything in one way or another. So I've got a dozen amphora jars of top quality Genoria olive oil. And I want to ship it from my town over there to Davisopolis. And how am I going to do that? Well, let's say I go by land. I've got to load these amphorae, maybe two to four a mule on mule back. And I've got to strap them in and hope that the mules don't panic. And mules are nastily stubborn, and they are prone to panic. 
And then I have a mule train that goes up into the mountains. And as I go up into the mountains, the mules have to take every step and not stumble and not go into a cliff, breaking my jars. I've got to go over hill, under hill, across bridges, across fords in the river, through the mountains, through the valleys, through bandits, through territory of foreign kind of kings who may want to tax me. Finally, I get them there. If I started out with a dozen jars, I'll be lucky if six or seven of them are still intact. Because so many things can go wrong by land. Now, it's not like I can just use a plastic jar. They don't have them. Amphorae are the best way that the ancients had to ship olive oil. And they break. They're like a clay pot. They are clay pots, in effect. So travel by land is slow. Think about it. You're not just going 50 miles or 75 miles straight, like across a river valley. You're going over and under and around and through. So if uh, Davisopolis is 50 miles away as the crow flies, I may end up walking close to 150 miles with my mules across the various switchbacks that I've got to take, as well as the vertical distances. So going by land, unless I have to, is stupid. What I want to do is I want to put my jars on a ship and have that ship go around the coast. Now, I still have to worry about storms, rocks, reefs, pirates, foreign navies, my crew mutinying. But the likelihood is, if those things don't happen, I make my way around the coast, it may seem longer, but I'm on a ship, and the ship is a reliable source. So I arrive in Davisport, maybe with all 12 of my amphorae intact. Maybe with 8 or 9 intact, maybe 10 or 11 intact. I have a much better chance of getting my product to market by ship than I do by land. So the Greeks are oriented towards the sea in a way that is very different from the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Akkadians, the uh, people of the Indus River Valley, or the Chinese. Uh, the Greeks are a people of the sea. The only people more oriented towards the sea are the ancient Phoenicians of the Levantine coast, the cities of Sidon and Tyre, north of Israel. So, the Greeks have these small city-states. They are oriented towards the sea. A lot of fishing going on. But there's one exception to all of this. And that is Sparta! Sorry, I've seen 300, so I can't just say Sparta! I've got to say it sort of loud. Well, maybe I don't got it. Maybe I can resist the urge. By the way, if you've ever seen 300, we'll see a clip or two. But it is not accurate. We will talk about how not accurate it is, <laughs> okay, because it's not. Uh, it's a fun movie, though, if you understand it's a comic book. Um, Sparta's the exception. Here's why. Sparta's down here. I actually put it in the wrong spot. Sparta is down here in the Peloponnesus, which is this um, lower area of Greece uh, that is a uh, peninsula. It's almost an island. Peninsula, almost an island. There's Sparta. And Sparta's in the only sizable river valley in all of Greece. And so Sparta is going to be the exception to all sorts of rules. Here's why. Because Sparta's in a river valley, and because the geographical rules of river valley say multiple cities, one city rules them all, Sparta ends up spreading out and conquering all the other cities in that valley. And then what the Spartans do is they destroy all the other cities in that valley. <laughs> Not the people, the places. They turn the people into a permanent slave class called helots. The helots are Sparta's slaves. At various times, the ratio of every Spartan, man, woman, and child, to slaves is 1 to 7, that's on the good side, to 1 to 20, that's on the bad side. So for every Spartan man, every Spartan woman, every Spartan child, there are between 7 and 20 of these helots, descended of the citizens of the other surrounding city-states from this valley. This is their wealth. This is their power. 
This is their paranoid obsession. These slaves and the capacity of these slaves to rebel is why the average Spartan woman was trained to kill the average slave man. And she could do it. She was very, very, very fit and very well trained in the arts of combat. Spartan men spend all their adult lives in the army. They come home for leave and happy times uh, and to, to look at their property, but they don't live there. They don't live with their wives. They live in the barracks. Spartan men from age seven leave their homes to join the army, and they're in the army for life or until they become so old that they can't soldier anymore or until they die, which is what happens to most of them. Why? If you have any questions about Sparta, the answer is either because it's in the only big valley or because of the slaves, the Helots. That's, that's, that's what determines Spartan everything. The Helots and the fact that they're the only Greeks that live in a wide valley. And we'll talk more next week. Remember, lesson tomorrow. Be ready for it. Have a happy and wondrous weekend. You too.